Welcome to Spooky Ass Shit. I am your host, Eric Dwinnells, back from vacation. As you may recall, I went on vacation to Disney World in Florida, and I have just returned home, and I must have brought the heat with me, as the old joke that your dad probably said once upon a time goes, because it is friggin' hot as balls here in Boston. Um, I am trying to record this episode, leaving the AC on. It is on the other side of the room. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but if I don't leave it on, I'm going to drip sweat into this microphone and ruin it. So we're going to do our best. If you hear a little rattle in the background, it's just gay, so you don't worry about it. Uh, so yes, today we are going to do a Disney-themed episode in a way, and we're going to branch out a little bit from what we might consider spooky. This is a, a topic I've brought up many times on the show before, is what exactly can we consider spooky? What qualifies? And the basic criteria is if I say that it's spooky, then it's spooky. That's why we cover all kinds of things from old TV specials to true crime to the supernatural, all kinds of things. But today's episode is even a little bit more different than normal. And again, it is Disney themed. We're going to be talking about the life and tragic end of the child actor Bobby Driscoll. If the name doesn't ring a bell, I will let you know that he was in the Disney movies Song of the South and Treasure Island, but perhaps most famously he is known as the voice of Peter Pan. So a lot of you, when you found out I was going on vacation to Disney World, I got some uh, letters and emails. Uh, Well, that's what I meant. I didn't get letters. I got emails and Facebook messages and whatnot asking if I was going to do a Disney-themed episode. And I think a lot of you wanted me to cover the Tower of Terror, which, trust me, I will get to. But again, I want to do a good, in-depth episode. And I'm even going to try to get a special guest on that episode, someone who has direct knowledge and even perhaps you might say a little bit of influence over the Tower of Terror. Don't know if I'm going to be able to get them on the show, but I'm going to try my best. So I'm holding off on that one. That's why tonight... We're going to be talking about Bobby Driscoll and his life story. But before we do, I do want to talk a little bit about my trip to Disney World. I'm going to have to get our old friend Aaron Cohen back in here. Because since the last time I was at the Magic Kingdom, they have built a gift shop for the Haunted Mansion. Now, they always had the gypsy cart outside, right? Uh, That had a few items that related to the Haunted Mansion. But now... It's got its own store, Memento More. Uh, So that was really cool. And I don't want to go into too much detail because, like I said, maybe I'll talk about it some other time. Maybe it will kind of be the entryway into the Tower of Terror episode. But uh, if you're in Disney World, I definitely recommend you stop in and check out that store out. I basically wanted one of everything. Couldn't afford it. Just got a couple items. Maybe I'll post them on the good old Instagram so you guys can check them out. Universal Studios, I went on the Mummy Ride for the first time. I know that's kind of an old ride by now, but I hadn't been on it uh, for multiple reasons in the past. Something, It's a long story, but I hadn't been able to get on it. Um, so I finally went on it. It's pretty good. It's a little bit dated now, um, even though it's not terribly old, but I still really miss Confrontation. If any of you went on Confrontation, you probably remember it being an amazing ride. I know I do. Uh, Maybe it wasn't as good as my memory makes it. I was 12 years old, the one and only time I went on that ride. But I remember loving that ride and it being like King Kong was right in your face. Uh, I loved it. There is a new King Kong ride at the studio. However, the line was so long, I was not able to go on that one on this particular journey. So that will have to wait till next time as well. I am happy to say, though, that the Monster Cafe at Universal Studios is still open. I was worried they might have taken it down, but the Universal Monsters are still getting some love over there with their own restaurant. Of course, it's overpriced. It's a theme park that's going to happen. But uh, you can sit in and amongst, you know, old movie posters and, and artwork and props and stuff like that. And they show clips from monster movies. So that's my favorite place to eat in Universal Studios. All right, before we dive into our main topic for tonight... I want to remind you all to check out the website SpookyAssShit.com or SpookyAss.com. They both take you to the same place. That is the show's blog page 
from there you can listen to each and every episode which reminds me listen to that i'm breaking my normal speech that reminds me i just noticed last week that itunes is taking down the earlier episodes as we go so i think maybe the first uh i don't know however many episodes are gone from itunes you can only hear them on the website now uh or maybe stitcher or iHeartRadio. i don't know how they do it but um yeah, so, so if you want to hear the early episodes, that's how we're going to have to do it. I might have to replay some of them. That'll give me a good option for other days when I'm just not quite feeling up to it or, uh, you know, need a little vacation again. Uh, I can dip back into the archives, but uh, I'm, I don't want to do that too often or anything. But here and there, I do reserve the right to do that. Um, but so, yes, that's a great way for you to check out the early episodes on the website. You can also sometimes find outtakes and pictures and stuff like that to go along with each episode. You can also find links to our social media. We are at Spooky As Shit on both Twitter and Instagram. And you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash spooky as. And I do hope you'll join us there. I'm an old man and Facebook is still my favorite social. I said so so I meant to say social media, but maybe I was right the first time. All right, let's dive into it. The life and tragic death of Bobby Driscoll, child star. Again, we need to kind of stretch our definition of what spooky is exactly. This is not spooky in and of itself, per se. But when you think of the dichotomy of him being a child star and not only a child star but a very popular child star in Disney movies and then you consider how his life turned out there's again it's not a supernatural kind of spooky in that way which is mostly what we try to talk about here or even kind of a true crime spooky this is just more of a you know the twist and turns of life and 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 I am really mumbly mouth tonight I'm not going to go back and fix it. You guys can understand. I'm just back from vacation. Um, but yeah, this is the kind of twist and turns that life can take and and what can happen if you're not careful out there. So I hope you will uh, enjoy this episode and allow me to expand our definition even further as we get to over 100 plus episodes. Don't worry, we're going to go back to talking about Bigfoot and aliens and ghosts and all that stuff on other episodes. But tonight... We're broadening our horizon and discussing Bobby Driscoll. Bobby Driscoll was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and he was the only child of an insulation salesman and a school teacher. In early 1943, the family moved to Los Angeles when a doctor advised Bobby's father to relocate to California because it would be easier on his breathing, which was suffering from work-related handling of asbestos. In LA, while Bobby was getting his hair cut, his barber noticed that he was a naturally good-looking kid and a very charming child and well-behaved as well. The barber's son happened to be an actor and he said, hey, you should let my son take Bobby uh, to the studio and see what's happening there. And the parents were like, oh, okay, Bobby, is that something you want to do? He seemed up for it. So they said, okay, go ahead. We'll, We'll bring him to the studio. Uh, So it turned out that the barber's son actually got him an audition at MGM Studios for a bit role in the 1943 family drama Lost Angel. Now, while he was touring the studio a lot, Bobby noticed that there was a, you know, a ship set, um, a prop ship. And he said, well, if there's a ship there, where's the water? He was five years old, you know. But the director was impressed by the boy's curiosity and his intelligence, and he chose him over 40 other children for the part. So that was his film debut, and it was brief. It was only two minutes, maybe, in the film. But it helped him win the role of young Al Sullivan, the youngest of the five Sullivan brothers in the 20th century Fox movie, The Fighting Sullivans. That came out in 1944. It was kind of a World War... It wasn't kind of. It was a World War II drama. After this, he appeared in many bit parts in movies, but he was not placed under contract by any studios until Walt Disney took notice of him. Up to this point, Disney had worked exclusively in animation, but they wanted to move into live action films as well. They were looking for child stars to star in their ambitious new project, Song of the South, 
which would be a blend of live action and animation. So Bobby and Luna Patton were the first two actors Walt Disney put under contract. The first two actors ever put under contract by Walt Disney. And both of them starred as the juvenile stars of Song of the South. The film turned its young actors into child stars, and they were discussed for a special Academy Award for young actors. But in 1947, the the Academy decided not to present any juvenile awards at all. Through no fault of Bobby's, Song of the South has become perhaps Disney's most controversial film due to its perceived inherent racism, indicating that its African-American characters were simple, affable, and happy to serve. The cartoon characters didn't fare much better as they were accused of depicting black stereotypes such as the crafty trickster, Brer Rabbit, the dim-witted oaf, Brer Bear, and the out-and-out criminal, Brer Fox. Disney has kept this film in the vaults for many years, but the ride based on the animated portion of the film, Splash Mountain, remains one of the most popular rides in Disney theme parks to this day. That movie is also where the song zippity doo comes from, in case you were wondering. Now nicknamed by the press America's Sweetheart Team, Driscoll and Patton starred together in the movie So Dear to My Heart for Disney. At this time, RKO distributed Disney's movies, and they took notice of young Bobby too. Because they had a good working relationship, Disney would loan Bobby out to RKO so they could use him in their own movies. Bobby played Eddie Cantor's son in the 1948 RKO Studios musical, If You Knew Susie. He also made the window for RKO. However, the eccentric millionaire Howard Hughes, who owned RKO, considered the film unworthy of release and believed that Bobby was not a very good actor. So he delayed its release. When it was finally released in May of 1949, it became a surprise hit. The New York Times credited Bobby with the film's success. Quote, the striking force and terrifying impact of this RKO melodrama is chiefly due to Bobby's brilliant acting, for the whole effect would have been lost were there any suspicion of doubt about the credibility of this pivotal character. The window is Bobby Driscoll's picture. Make no mistake about it. Both So Dear to My Heart and The Window were enough to earn Bobby Driscoll a special juvenile Oscar at the 1950 ceremony for Outstanding Juvenile Actor of 1949. Bobby was then cast to play Jim Hawkins in Walt Disney's live-action version of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. It would be the studio's first all-live-action motion picture. The feature was filmed in the United Kingdom, and during production it was discovered that Bobby did not have a valid British work permit, so his family and Disney were fined and ordered to leave the country. They were allowed to remain for six weeks to prepare an appeal, and director Byron Haskin hastily shot all of Bobby's close-ups, then used a British stand-in child to fill the missing scenes after his parents and Bobby had returned to California. Treasure Island turned out to be another national hit, and work came Bobby's way rapidly. In addition to his brief guest appearance in Walt Disney's first television Christmas show in 1950, One Hour in Wonderland, Bobby lent his voice to the character of Goofy Jr. in the Disney cartoon short Feathers Are People and Father's Lion, which were released in 1951 and 1952. Perhaps Bobby's biggest success came when he was chosen to give voice to the titular character of Peter Pan in, of course, Walt Disney's Peter Pan. It was produced largely between May of 49 and mid-1951. Bobby was cast with Disney's little British lady, Catherine Beaumont, who was in the role of Wendy Darling. He was also used as a reference model for the close-ups, and of course provided Peter's voice, though a dancer was hired to model the character's actual movement. The scenes were played on an almost empty stage with only the most essential props and sets, and filmed. Those films were then used as reference points by the illustrators. This is how things were done before motion capture suits became a thing. In his biography of Walt Disney, Mark Elliott described Bobby as Walt's favorite 
live-action child star. Quote, Walt often referred to Driscoll with great affection as the living embodiment of his own youth, end quote. However, during a project meeting following the completion of Peter Pan, Walt stated that he now saw Driscoll as best suited for roles as a young bully rather than as a likable protagonist. Bobby's Disney salary had been raised to $1,750 per week, and yet, for all that money, the studio decided not to use him very much from 1952 on. The writing was on the wall. In March of 1953, just weeks after Peter Pan was released theatrically, Bobby's Disney contract was cancelled. Bobby, according to some stories, attempted to speak to Walt himself and was told he was busy. He then asked to speak to the next highest up person and was told they were busy too. Then the secretary disappeared from the room for a moment and came back very sternly telling Bobby he had to go and that security was on their way to escort him out of the building. I don't know if that's true but that is one of the tales circulating. When asked by the press why Bobby's contract had been so abruptly cancelled, Disney Studios eventually said it was due to a severe case of acne accompanying the onset of puberty, and this is why they could no longer use him as a child star in their movies. Bobby encountered indifference from other studios, too. Still perceived as Disney's kid actor, he was a unable to get movie roles as a serious actor. Beginning in 1953, and for most of the next three years, the bulk of his work was on television, such as anthology series and dramas like The Fireside Theater, Schultz Playhouse of Stars, Front Row and Center, Ford Theater, Studio One, Dragnet Medic, and Dick Powell's Zane Gray Theater. After he left Disney Studios, Bobby's parents withdrew him from Hollywood Professional School, which served child actors and sent him to the public Westward University High School instead. There, his grades dropped substantially. He was the target of ridicule for his previous film career, and this is when he began to take drugs. He said later, quote, The other kids didn't accept me. They treated me as one apart. I tried desperately to be one of the gang. When they rejected me, I fought back. I became belligerent and cocky and I was afraid all the time." End quote. At his request, Bobby's parents returned him to Hollywood Professional School the next year, from which he graduated in 1955. After graduation to help pay the bills between acting gigs, he took a job parking cars at a bank parking lot. During this time, his drug use increased. In an interview years later, he stated, I was 17 when I first experimented with the stuff. In no time, I was using whatever was available, mostly heroin, because I had the money to pay for it. In 1956, he was arrested for the first time for possession of marijuana. The story goes that police arrested his friend, Lester Ferguson. Police knew that Ferguson had just left Bobby's home, so they went and picked up Bobby as well. Though the charge was eventually dismissed, the arrest certainly didn't help Bobby's already faltering career. On July 24, 1956, Hedda Hopper wrote in Los Angeles Times, quote, This could cost this fine lad and good actor his entire career. Bobby's lawyer told reporters all of Bob's troubles stem from his unfortunate choice of companions. Police were quoted as saying that they knew both Bobby and Ferguson and the kind of company that they choose to keep. Bobby admitted as much in later interviews, saying, Let's face it, I was a wild kid, but harmless. The only person I ever hurt was myself. He went on to say that he judged people by how they treated him, and how he can relate to them. He never cared if his friends had a criminal history, so long as they shared the same taste in music. A month later, Bobby was arrested again, this time for allegedly pelting two women with a bean shooter while driving in a car with Lester Ferguson. The charges were eventually dropped again, this time because the women they had hit declined to press charges. In 1957, he had only two television roles. As the loyal brother of a criminal immigrant on M Squad, a long-running crime series, and as an officer aboard a submarine in an episode of the World War II docudrama series The Silent Service. In December of 1956, 
Bobby and his girlfriend of five months, Marilyn Rush, eloped to Mexico to get married to avoid their parents' objections. Both his parents and her parents were against the couple getting married. The couple were eventually re-wed in Los Angeles in a ceremony that took place in March of 57. The couple eventually had two daughters and one son, and Bobby began work at a hut at a hat shop to make ends meet between acting gigs, but this relationship didn't last. They separated and then divorced in 1960. In an interview years later, Bobby would state that he and Marilyn were both lonely people who leaned on each other for strength, but he believed they were just too young to be married. He says the only thing that kept them together for as long as they were were the children. Eventually, Marilyn was committed to a mental hospital and the children were taken in by friends. Bobby paid for their care with a trust fund that had been set up for him while he was making big money working for Disney. Bobby began using the name Robert Driscoll to distance himself from his youthful roles as Bobby. Since 1951, he had been known by friends and family simply as Bob. He landed two final screen roles in the 1955 release The Scarlet Coat and The Party Crashers, released in 1958. His last known appearance on TV were small roles in two single-season series, The Best of the Post and The Brothers Branigan, both originally aired on November 5, 1960. Bobby continued to struggle in his personal life, too. He was again arrested after he and a group of friends were found with heroin paraphernalia, though these charges would also eventually be dropped. After his marriage dissolved, Bobby became homeless, often sleeping on the beach. He could have gone home to his parents, and sometimes he did, but he didn't want to stay there too long. He felt he'd trouble them enough already. He dropped in on a friend living in Topanga Canyon and noticed a beautiful blonde sunning herself next door. He asked the friend to introduce him, and before long, Bobby was dating Susan Stansbury. Two weeks into their courtship, Bobby was washing Suzanne's car while she sunned herself in the front yard. A car full of young men pulled up and made some lewd comments to the bikini-clad Susan. This sent Bobby into a rage. He started throwing rocks at the young men's car when they refused to apologize. The men hollered some insults back and Bobby grabbed a fake pistol, which he kept in his car's glove box, and began an altercation with the offending young men. He pummeled one of them with the handle of the fake gun, bloodying his nose, all the while both sides of the argument were shouting profanities. He was arrested again, and this time he pled guilty to disturbing the peace and disorderly conduct. He paid a $52 fine and was placed on probation for two years. Just a couple of months later, both he and Suzanne were arrested yet again. This time, they were charged with breaking into an animal shelter and stealing almost $500 worth of checks. The checks were never found, and eventually, the charges were dropped. A month later, he was arrested again for attempting to use a check that had been stolen in another robbery four months prior. He was released on a $2,500 bail, but two hours later, he was arrested again on suspicion of driving while under the influence of narcotics. Bobby claimed he had taken some pills, but they were prescribed by a doctor. Some of these charges would eventually be dropped, but thanks to the narcotics charge, he was sentenced to prison for six months. His relationship with Susan seems to have ended sometime around here, although it's a little bit unclear. When Bobby left prison in early 62, he was unable to find acting work. Embittered by this, he was quoted as saying, quote, I have found that memories are not very useful. I was carried on a silver platter and then dumped into the garbage. End quote. When a reporter asked him to pose for a picture holding the Oscar he had won when he was 12, he said, I don't know where it is. I think it burned up in a trailer I used to travel with. Besides, that is something I earned as a child. It would be like posing with a teddy bear. In 1963, Bobby met Sharon Morrill, and the two began dating. They held a wedding ceremony, but it was kind of an unofficial beatnik kind of thing. The two shared a mutual love of drugs and began making plans to smuggle drugs into New York City. But according to Sharon's brother, the pair got ripped off in a drug deal and had to hide out in Canada. 
When things cooled down, Sharon decided to return to L.A., but Bobby decided to return to New York City, though the couple remained committed to each other until 1967. Once back in New York City, Bobby began hanging around Andy Warhol's factory, which was essentially a collaborative for creative people. There, Bobby focused on making collages and writing poetry. Some of his poetry was published, as a matter of fact. In early 1965, Driscoll gave his last known film performance in experimental filmmaker Pero Hecklizer's... No idea if that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, he made an underground movie called Dirt, which both Bobby and Sharon appeared in. Sometime in 1968, Bobby was arrested again, although the reason why is not exactly clear. We can't find documents exactly why he was arrested. But while he was in jail, he wrote to beat poet Allen Ginsberg, asking for money. By this time, Bobby had burned through his entire savings. He could not get any work, and he had developed hepatitis through his drug use, and his addiction was only growing stronger. In late 1967, or perhaps early 1968, Bobby stopped showing up at Andy Warhol's factory and disappeared into Manhattan's underground. On March 30th, 1968, about three weeks after his 31st birthday, two little boys were playing in a deserted East Village tenement at 371 East 10th Street, and they found a body lying on a cot, with two empty beer bottles and religious pamphlets scattered all over the ground. The medical examination determined that the person had died of heart failure caused by an advanced hardening of the arteries due to long-time drug abuse. There was no identification on the body, and photos taken of it and shown around the neighborhood yielded no positive identification. Of course, this was Bobby Driscoll's body. Bobby's body went unclaimed, so he was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave in New York City's Potter's Field at Hart Island. Bobby's mother had no clue her son had died. He would call home at least once a month, but when the calls stopped, she began to worry. She considered calling the New York Police Department, but, fearing they would discover Bobby and that he would be on drugs and that they would arrest him, she decided not to call. About a year and a half after Bobby's death, his father's health took a turn for the worse. Wanting to reunite the family one last time before the father passed away, Bobby's mother began to ask for help in finding Bobby. She placed ads in New York City papers, but of course, Bobby never responded. She reached out to Disney, and they were able to convince police to take a look for Bobby. It was then discovered that Bobby's fingerprints match a deceased drug addict that had been discovered in an abandoned building. Late in 1969, about 19 months after his death, Although Bobby's name appears on his father's gravestone at Eternal Hills Memorial Park in Oceanside, California, his remains still rest on Hart Island. Bobby's death was not reported until the re-release. Bobby's death was not reported in the papers until the re-release of his first Disney film, Song of the South, in 1971 and 72 when reporters were researching the whereabouts of the film's major cast members and Bobby's mother revealed the tragic outcome of his life. She went on to state that she hoped the real release of the movie would spark a conversation between parents and children about the dangers of drug addiction. In this way, she hoped, Bobby's death wouldn't be in vain. And there you have it, the tragic life and death of Peter Pan himself, the lost boy, Bobby Driscoll. That really is a sad story. It just, again, it's that dichotomy of, you know, we think we, we love Peter Pan, right? We love these Disney movies that he was in. We kind of feel like we've grown up with him, some of us who grew up watching these movies over and over again. And then you kind of wonder, oh, what, whatever happened to that guy? And then you Google it and you're like, oh my God, this is such a, you died alone in an abandoned building and he, he felt like the world kind of turned its back on him. And I guess to an extent, maybe it did. But this is one of those things where you just wish they had found a way to beat their demons, you know, because he definitely would have received so much love later on in life. Uh, maybe not at the time when he needed it, which was back in these days. But, I mean, 
there are Disney fanatics out there. I, I mean, I love Disney and I'm I'm into it, but I'm not. I wouldn't call myself a fanatic. In fact, you know, Disney World, I kind of have mixed feelings about. To be honest with you, I think I've mentioned that on the show before. I think it represents, um, in some ways, the best of the American ideal, and in some ways, the worst. Uh, when you go visit Disney World. So, but anyway, I'll get into that another time if I haven't already. But yeah, this is just, uh, I just feel like if, if he'd only been able to stick it out, he, he would have been a Disney legend, right? And he, he could have hopefully cleaned his act up and, but it just, it wasn't to be. And that's a, a very sad ending. And now I hope I haven't ruined Peter Pan for you. Every time you watch it, you're going to think about the fact that Peter Pan died alone. And high on drugs, most likely. Um, actually, I take that back. I think the report said at the time there were no drugs found in his system. So who knows? Maybe he was trying to clean up and it was just already too late. His uh, his arteries had already hardened and his uh, cardiac event was scheduled and that's what happened. Uh, but again, a different kind of spooky perhaps, but spooky nonetheless in my eyes. Something that can be so innocent and family friendly and yet in real life take such a dark turn once again before we wrap up here i'd like to point you to the show's website spookyas.com or spookyashit.com both take you the same place that's the show's blog page you can find us on instagram and twitter both at spooky ass shit and you can like us on facebook at facebook.com slash spooky as now please share the show rate the show subscribe write a review some kind words however you happen to be listening to this particular episode if they leave you a chance to comment or to write a review please go ahead and do that and spread the show that's the only way we get more listeners and uh, like I said all your your happy emails and and positive kind words on reviews they keep me going they keep this show fueled and running I am a, a bit of a creature of vanity so I like to see those five-star reviews and i hope you will write some take a little break right now from what you're doing the show's almost over it's all right you can stop it now and go ahead and write a review i would totally appreciate that so until next time have a happy fourth of july if you're one of my american friends celebrating that upcoming holiday in fact even if you're not an american go ahead and celebrate the fourth of july you don't have to celebrate america's independence just celebrate the fact that it's the fourth of july have a cookout some uh, cheeseburgers, hot dogs, or whatever you guys like. I don't know. Some sauerkraut. And, I don't know. Whatever, whatever country you're in, whatever you guys eat. Go ahead and eat that. Until next time, don't do drugs. And don't be afraid. <laughs>